So this week we're going to focus on LAM partitioning systems. So when I'm talking about LAM partitioning systems, I'm talking about the cultural ways uh, that land is divided for ownership or identifying uh, land use. And these land division, div dividing systems or partitioning systems are, are really uh, very tightly um, connected to our cultural heritage. And each of the systems creates a very different look on the landscape or it divides the land into specific geometries. We're going to look at uh, meets and bounds, French long lot, uh, Spanish land grant, and then uh, the PLSS system. So the systems with the exception of the PLSS, so that would be the meets and bounds, French long lot, Spanish land grant, are all uh, systems that create a very irregular geometry. And some people might think of it more as uh, with meets and bounds as kind of a crazy quilt. Um, pieces of land don't have a similar pattern. Um, they can be circular or square or rectangular or pie shaped. And when we talk about meets and bounds, there are um, three components to that. There are landmarks, um, there's direction, and then there's distance. And this system was um, diffused into the United States from immigrant uh, English immigrants or English settlers. And so what we see is the um, occurrence of meets and bounds in the north and in the south of the of the U.S. and the primarily the original 13 colonies. In the north, these meets and bounds are very clustered because northern communities tended to have uh, less large uh, agricultural holdings. And in the south, uh, the meets and bounds settlements or land partitioning seemed to be larger areas of land because there was more, uh, more developed and, and larger um, agricultural plots. So to understand meets and bounds, we have to review kind of compass directions a little bit. And so um, just like when, when we were talking about longitude and latitude, longitude is that uh, 360 degrees around the circle. And so um, 0 degrees and 360 degrees are both uh, due north. And then 90 degrees is east. 180 degrees is south, 270 is west, and, and on around. When we're using meets and bounds, the system is a little different, where um, there are two cardinal directions used and a degree, and then a distance. So, for example, the meets um, in incorporates the compass bearing and the distance. So, if I were trying to identify this point A, I might say that it is 30 degrees east of north, so it's written uh, N30 degrees east, and then however many uh, feet I would need to, to go to that point. So if the origin is here and I walk 100 feet 30 degrees east of north, I would go up to that point. And I could say uh, north 60 degrees west, which means I'm going in the opposite direction. Or you could do this um, 70 degrees uh, east of south. So that would be this direction or 80 degrees west of south, meaning that direction. So when we look at meets and bounds, the meets are the, the distance and the um, the cardinal or the direction and the bounds are the descriptors. So, you know, I might say 30 degrees north, uh, 100 meters, 30 degrees north of east or east of north um, on Willamette Street. And so here is an example of uh, meets and bounds description: a parcel bounded on the west Bruno Road. So it gives you all of the kind of the linear descriptors, and then it gives you the uh, exact north 30 degrees 42 minutes 6 seconds west um, how many feet and then you go north 86 degrees 38 minutes 35 degrees east uh, of north so it's a very detailed um, particular land description system and as I said earlier you're going to see that 
primarily in the original 13 colonies, a little bit in Texas, but Texas is also overrun by the Spanish land grants. Um, and again, it gives you very irregular shaped lots. And so here uh, is is a lot description. Um, here is a, a current lot description, and these are still used today. So they're very, uh, very detailed, very specific. There's some difficulties with meets and bounds. Um, one is that that irregular shape property makes it very difficult for for descriptions. They're very complex. Um, the other problem is that many of the boundaries. Uh, that, that were used, especially in historic meets and bounds, uh, are subject to erosion, to, um, change over time. And so if you were saying, you know, Bill's house, that could be gone, or the old oak tree, or by the edge of the river, rivers tend to change. Um, and so, um, one of the reasons that they didn't want to use it in the West is that Meets and bounds are developed by people who are on the landscape and they walk the land and they claim the area that they want. Um, so it, it wasn't a system that could be translated to the far west where people hadn't really been yet. And, and that will become clear, I hope, in a minute. Um, here's an example of, um, one of the problems with meets and bounds. So uh, this is a section of the Willamette River up near Salem. And that blue line in the middle is the county boundary. So when the counties were um, delineated, the river ran uh, up, or that county line was in the middle of the river. And over time, you can see where the river has shifted. Um, and uh, more land has been added and, and uh, less riverfront which would have been critical back in the day, uh, is not available in that county. So I was looking for some examples of meats and browns, and I found this in England, and I have, I just named it Starville, but I don't know what it is. Um, that would, it's just so fascinating, this kind of star pattern. It's a little freaky and fascinating. Um, so, Gosh, I'm going to research that later. So anyway, this is an example of meets and bounds. Um, you can see that uh, the 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 uh, texture you see or the bumpiness here is from trees, um, and so they give you that 3D or shadowed uh, effect on the air, aerial imagery. But you can see that, and and those trees or hedgerows tend to define edges of property, so it's really nice for kind of looking at property ownership. But you can see that none of these parcels are the same size or shape um, as as other parcels. And so, why would people use land in that way? Why would they claim it in that way? Well, partially, um, meets and bounds was a way to claim um, good land and leave poor land out of the mix. So if you were going to be charged for land or you could only have a certain amount of land, you're going to want to maximize your benefits. So you might want land that's along a river edge or you might want land that's drained better or not rocky um, or that is not prone to flood. So your your land patterns are, are going to follow the organic shape of the land and not so much a geometric um, imposed shape. The second type of land uh, division or partition I want you to know about is the French long lot. Um, and again, this was brought to the United States, uh, cultural diffusion or relocation diffusion. It was part of the French feudal system. Uh, land grants or, oh, I cannot say that word, uh, seigneuries. Or, um, it sounds more Spanish when I say it, or apparent land grants were given to wealthy people or people um, in lieu of payment for military service. And an apparent is a uh, linear measurement of 58 meters. So they were um, land grants that were of a specific size. And um, the French long lot got its name because um, the land tend to have very linear, uh, long and narrow uh, land divisions. And the reason was that uh, people wanted to be able to maximize um, 
everyone's access to roads or to transportation. So here is an example of um, some land divisions in Quebec. And you can see they're all very, very narrow and very linear. Um, and But that maximized everyone having access to the water. And so, you know, people would uh, be able to have land that was um, somewhat soggy, somewhat dry, somewhat near the road or somewhat near the river. And it was a very um, nice way to equalize and distribute the resources. So one person didn't get all the good land and everybody else got rocky uh, land that was um, not, not good for agriculture. Originally, these land grants were not as narrow as they are today, but um, these very narrow systems began to happen as people had children and then would subdivide their land for their children and then those children would subdivide land for their grandchildren. So over time, um, many of these um, uh, land parcels are about the width of a house and then, you know, many, many uh, feet back from the, from the uh, frontage line or the property line. This is an example today, and you can see those linear patterns up in Quebec. So um, if it was uh, diffused from French uh, cultural practices, you would expect to see this uh, being practiced in places where there is a lot of French ancestry. And so um, if you were to look in this part of the United States and absolutely this part of Louisiana, you would absolutely see many of these French uh, long lot systems and, and you'll be looking at some um, using uh, some software this week. So in the 1600s to the eight to about 1850, um, most of the southern United States, south uh, western United States was um, part of the Mexican uh, or the U.S. the Spanish territory and then after that the Mexican uh, Republic and so um, there are many uh, grants that were given by the Spanish uh, government or Spanish monarchy at the time um, so they had three types of grants a Pueblo grant that was given to uh, many of the Native Americans uh, which is also the basis of current Pueblos in uh, New Mexico today, private grants, and most of those were given for government service. And then there were community grants that were, you know, given to entice settlers to develop the land or just held as grazing commons. Um, one of the requirements of these Spanish land grants was that people had to be able to make a living and be actually on the land for a certain number of years and make it prosper. They couldn't just own it and hold on to it. They had to actually uh, make it uh, make it make a living on that land and then after a few years they were deeded the land. One of the things that would be important especially in this area of the United States was water and so you see water uh, boundaries, uh, watersheds, arroyos, rivers as important aspects either of the edges of these land grants or, or um, a land grant occupying an entire small watershed. So this is the uh, Socorro quadrangle, seven and a half minute. And you can see that these grant boundaries are still um, identifiable on uh, the USGS topo maps. So the last system that we'll talk about, and we'll spend a lot of time with this uh, the lab will touch on this a little bit and then the, the second lab on Thursday will go into this in more detail is the United States Public Land Survey System or called the PLSS and this system has a very regular geometry um, and it was also um, highly systematically surveyed and I would say actually if you looked at the French long lot they have also a pretty regular uh, survey but um, but this has kind of clearly been identified in the text as, as uh, geometrically regular and different from the others. Um, the reason that this survey system was developed uh, first by what was called the GLO or the, uh, the General Land Ordinance in the, in the early 1800s was to find a way to um, 
partition the land in the west west of the uh, west of Ohio, so that that land could be deeded to soldiers and to settlers before they left uh, the East Coast. So they would be given uh, property deeds, or or the property would be already deeded into uh, appropriate sections, and so they could move out, um, find their property, and um, be able to. Uh, settle the West. We had a lot of concerns with Russia uh, coming over to the West Coast and claiming property, and so we wanted to make sure that we had established settlements uh, in that area. So the uh, PLSS system is um, dominant in the Western United States, and the, and the more you uh, go East, uh, the fewer and fewer examples you see. So in order to set up um, a system that would be uniform for partitioning land, they set up a series of uh, origination lines called um, a principal meridian and a baseline. And so um, every few states, or if it was a large state, it had its own system. Um, Oregon and Washington shared a system, so there was one meridian, or that would be analogous to a longitude line, that ran uh, down north to south on that, on that state or those states, and then there was a baseline that cut across basically the middle of that area. And so the idea was if you set up these smaller sections, you could begin to lay out a grid pattern um, that would describe land ownership based on that principal meridian and baseline. So we can zoom in here on Oregon and Washington. And so here's the Willamette Meridian. In Idaho, the meridian is called the Boise Meridian. There are a couple um, in California. Here's the small Humboldt Meridian. So the Willamette Meridian has um, is crossed by a baseline. And if you have ever lived in Colorado? Um, there are there's a street that or road that runs through the state called Baseline. Um, in Oregon, there is a uh, street called Meridian, which is the Willamette Meridian uh, location, and I think we even have a, a road called Baseline, which you can see uh, Meridian and Baseline. So that would be probably the origin of uh, of one of these uh, grid systems. So once the Meridian and the baseline were established, so once that was surveyed in, um, surveyors put in a series of ranges. And a, ra and a range was a distance uh, six miles east and west of that meridian. So right now you can see that to the west I have two ranges, and this one is probably not very accurate. Anyway, um, so from from the meridian, I would be going one range east, and then here would be another range east, and if I had another line, it would be another range east. So this is uh, range one east, that would be range, I'm sorry, this is range one west, and that would be range two west. Um, and then to the east, so you can forget that last two minutes there, um, there were meridians lined up north to south, uh, range lines lined up north to south on the east. So this would be range 1 east, range 2 east, range 3 east, range 4 east. And those were uh, moved across the, across the entire state. And they were 6 miles in, in distance from one range to the other. So then to complete the grid system, a series of township lines were uh, created and the township lines were created north and south of the baseline. So six miles north of the baseline is township one. Uh, six miles north of township one is township two north. Six miles south of the baseline is township one south and then six miles further south is the next township, uh, township two south. So they were able to grid out each of these uh, baseline and meridian areas with 
um, a grid system of townships and ranges, townships running north and south of the baseline, and ranges running east and west of the meridian. And I think in Oregon we have, I don't know how many townships, but I know, I believe the, the ranges get, um, I don't know, I was thinking 34 mile, we have uh, range 34 east, but there may be even more than that. It'd be easy to figure out if we have if the states, what, 300 miles east to west, or, yeah. Anyway, I don't know what it is. We could look that up. So once you've got that township and range grid uh, figured out, that's a, a, a six by six mile grid. So that's 36 miles. So you're not giving anybody 36 square miles. That's way too much land. So they took each of those uh, squares that were created by the intersections of the township and ranges, and they divided those into 36 one mile squares. So here is the section for, uh, let's see, Township is first, so township one south because it's one grid south of the baseline, and town and range one west because it's one line west of the baseline. So there's that township one south, range one west of the Willamette Meridian, and inside that they gridded 36 one mile squares, and they always numbered them from 1 to 36, with 1 starting in the northeast corner of that section, or of that grid. And these small squares or grids are called sections. So there are 36 sections in every township and range. So even that is too big. That's one mile square. And so most of the settlers were given, you know, 320 acres, um, or less, and so they needed a way to subdivide each section. So here is a um, a very nice diagram showing um, township two south, range two west, section thirteen. So you would actually say the section first. So section thirteen, township two south, range two west of whatever meridian this is. And so if I were lucky enough to get a quarter of this area, and if I go back to here, I think that is um, 160 acres. If I were deeded 160 acres, I would be given the northwest one quarter of section 13 of township two south, range two west, and if this were the Willamette Meridian of the Willamette Meridian. And maybe... Um, Maybe I was given the northeast one quarter of section 13, township two south, range two west. And then maybe I had three children and I divided my land holdings and I gave my son the northeast one quarter of the northeast one quarter of section 13 of township two south, range two west, Willamette Meridian. So this is the way the township and range section um, is uh, is used, still used today. Um, so here's some kind of the different units of measurement. 320 acres would be a half of a section. Um, a quarter of a section would be 160 acres and so on and so forth. And so there's just another way to look at that. So if you get out your Eugene uh, East map, and you can pause this if you want, um, take a break and then come back, you can get out your Eugene East map, and we're going to look at uh, the township and range uh, marks that are on the topographic map. So if you look along that uh, western edge of the um, Eugene East map, you will see uh, some red um, numbers off to the side on the margin and this uh, shows where Township 17 South and Township 18 South uh, where the line is between those two townships. So we know that we are 17 township lines below the baseline and if we multiplied that by 6 we'd know how many miles we are from the baseline. 
The um, township and range lines on a topo map are, I think, almost always in red. And so, which is a little confusing because these road lines are also in red. But this dotted, or this dashed line here, where the green arrow is pointing, is the line between Township 17 South and Township 18 South. So everything north of this line on this map is in Township 17 South. And everything south of that line on this map is in Township 18 South. The range line, so let's move all the way up to the top of the map and we're still in Township 17 South. And you see that the range line divides range 4 West and range 3 West um, on this dotted line. So I am, I am 3, I am 3 times 6, so I am 18 uh, miles west of uh, the Willamette Meridian because there are 6 miles to each range line and I'm in range 3. So on the uh, Eugene East map, we're only seeing a very small part of range 14 west. Most of this map that you're looking at is in range 13 west. So if you remember on uh, the lab, I had you measure the, the length and the width of a, of a seven and a half minute topographic map. And the longitude or the distance that the ranges are covering uh, from east to west was, um, was it six miles, something like that? So that would really only be one entire range section. So um, you have to kind of think about how big, how big these areas are. So that is um, the location. Now you'll notice there's a six here on this map. That six is section six. So that would make sense. I'm going to go back up to this example here. Oh, this is better. So you can see if we start counting one down to six, then my next range would be the next section over. If we look at the one I have, um, one to six, and then I'm going to start counting over one to six. And so if this is range uh, one, this would be range two. This would be the meridian, and this over on this side would be range one east. You'll get the hang of it, I promise. So if I look at this section, and I want to give the legal description for this section, or if I want to say uh, Whitney Landing County Park is in, where, where is that located? It is in section six. It is in section six of Township 17 South, Range 3 West, Willamette Meridian. And if I wanted to get really fancy, I could kind of mentally divide this into quarters and I could say that Whitney Landing is in the southwest one quarter of Section 6, Township 17 South, Range 3 West of the Willamette Meridian. So if you scan that Eugenie's topographic map, you're going to be perplexed because earlier I said there were 33 sections, or 36 sections, and so when you look at the middle of the uh, Eugene East-West, or the Eugene uh, East map, you will see that there are sections that are higher than 36. So here's a section 39, there's a section 38, <coughs> excuse me, there's a section 64. So what the heck is going on here? So when you see a section number that is higher than 36, what that is indicating is a land claim that was prior to the dividing the land by the, the GLO uh, and before the PLSS survey system was in place out in our area. And these are areas that are probably part of a donation land claim or a prior claim. So um, about the same time that the PLSS was being implemented, uh, settlers were already on their way out to Oregon to claim land under the Donation Land Claim Act. People who got there chose the best land and they used the, the um, 
land partition systems they were familiar with. So um, they used meets and bounds, and they used French long lot. And so if you look under, uh, if you look up in uh, the middle of Marion County um, near St. Paul, you'll see some land divisions that indicate uh, French long lot. In the Willamette Valley, a lot of the earlier claims look like meets and bounds. People wanted the best land. So, for example, on this section of the Willamette River, if I were an early settler, I might want um, this high piece of land uh, that drained well, and then I might want a lot of river access in order to use shipping uh, to get my crops down to Portland. Again, somebody else comes in and they're going to claim this part of the land. Somebody else is going to claim that. Somebody just wants this narrow little section here. So we get a very irregular uh, prior land ownership um, on the landscape. And so then come in the GLO server, surveyors and they began to uh, lay out their grid. And so they lay the grid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, on and on and on, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. They lay out their grids, but oh crud, look, there's already people here. There's already land claims here. So what they had to do was realize that um, Section 2 was going to be a lot smaller than Section 1 because there was already a claim in Section 2. Um, section 5 actually is not one square mile because there's part of the river. And in Oregon, you cannot own the river. river is not uh, able to be privately owned. Look at Section 9. If I were a settler and I were uh, given a deed to Section 9, um, and I moved out here, I would be pretty bummed because all they get is that little section south of the river and that little tiny, those two tiny sections north of the river. Um, that's really all that's left of section 9. Section 10 has a couple small sections. So they went through, the surveyors went through and named the section numbers in a regular uh, method and then they came back and started uh, giving um, section numbers to the prior claims. Okay, so um, if I have a claim that is as high as 70 or 80, that means that there were a lot of prior claims in that section. So for example, I'm looking at 72, 71, 46, 48, all of these along uh, this section of the Willamette, of course, these were settled very early, and they were prime lands, um, and so uh, they have higher numbers than the than the regular uh, donation land claim, or than the regular PLSS system. Okay, so um, for an exam with this section, I am going to. I want you to be able to compare uh, the three methods of land division, meets and bounds. Uh, PLSS and French long lot um, to really compare them uh, you would need more than one or two sentences or a couple points you would need to really talk about the history and the reason and the way the land looks um, and uh, I also want you to be able to use uh, the correct nomenclature to identify parcels um, let's see, where's the example I had here? Uh, right here. So by section, by quarter section, by quarter, quarter section. And I'm also going to post a reading that's kind of a tutorial. Uh, I think it was developed uh, for Michigan surveyors. Um, but it, it gives you a very nice description of how to talk about uh, township and range. Okay.